Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson, and welcome to Lecture 12A. In today's lecture, we are going to be reviewing several things that has to do with the flow of money on projects. Uh, progress payments, schedule of values, and indeed, cash flow. A very important part of success in construction. Uh, as my mother-in-law says, no money, no funny. And so there's a lot of truth in that. Uh, so uh, in these uh, uh, particular lecture, we're gonna look at um, the different uh, progress payment processes. Though a way of looking at things, we'll talk about the perfect world scenario. Uh, what is the schedule of values? What does it mean? And um, how that act actually shows up, say in a how it can be predicted, how it can be monitored in a software program such as Microsoft Project, where you can actually uh, do a cost-loaded schedule and see how the payments um, are being made, uh, or basically the outflow of um, work and money that's going on a project. And then you can look at the inflows, uh, which is really your breakdown of your schedule of values. Uh, so we'll use that as kind of a tool to explain it, visualize it better, because I often feel that um, it's not that well understood. Uh, it's understood clearly when you don't have money, but it's not that under well understood how you it can be predictive and managed effectively in a project. So we'll review these. So really, when we think about cash flow, uh, it, you should be thinking about it in two ways. One, the amount of money that's going out in a project and the amount of money that's coming in and how do they compare and match up to each other. If you have more money going out than is coming in, then you have a shortfall. So then the big question is, do you have the liquidity uh, to be able to manage through that shortfall? If you don't, you're sunk. The business is done because if you can't pay people, nobody's gonna work for you, including your own employees. So that's usually a big indicator when somebody can't pay um, their short-term term obligations, that causes a problem. And in construction, you could have very profitable projects that if you're able to complete them to fruition, uh, they could be, you know, make you a lot of money. But if during that project, you run into a condition where you do, don't have the capital, the liquidity, we call it, to be able to pay it, it's tied up in other things, or you've maxed out on your line of credit, then you're really stuck. And so you really need to be able to manage through that process because these subcontractors, these suppliers, these employees, they want to be paid when they want to be paid. Um, cash inflow, well, now you're getting it from a source, often a single source, such as a particular client. And so if that single source is unable to pay you for a variety of reasons, you could potentially be in a cash crunch. Um, so we have to manage that as a business very effectively. And uh, we have to also make sure that we have certain cushions in place because sometimes the unexpected happens. Maybe a client runs into a cash flow problem of their own and they're unable to pay you. And it's kind of a ripple effect that goes through things because then you're not able to pay your subcontractors. Then maybe some of your subcontractors are not able to pay their employees. And so there can be this sort of extenuating a cascading effect. And if you really want to look closely at something that was similar to that, it would have been the financial crisis of 2008 when all of a sudden banks ran into liquidity problems and they were unable to pay out to customers. And that caught, potentially could have brought the whole economy to a screeching halt. Uh, so uh, these things often can have bigger impacts than might first have been noticed. And in a perfect world, a contractor would be able to get all their money from this client before they started the project. Wouldn't that be nice? So you get all the money for the project right on day one, and now you have no worries, you'll be able to pay the money out. Of course, that's not reality. Um, in a perfect world from the client's perspective, they wouldn't pay you till the end of the project. And then they don't have to worry about you going bankrupt or not paying somebody during construction or not doing the work to the quality expectation. Uh, they don't have to worry about that. So it'd be right at the end of the project. The truth is it's a negotiation and we've talked about this in earlier lectures, but it's a negotiation to make sure that 
you are getting paid for the work that you're doing as it's being done and that it meets the quality expectations. And from the client's perspective, you're not getting paid in excess of the work that you performed. Uh, it's unethical really to try to front and load your payments so that you have more than was paid during the project. And clients that are astute and wise to this do everything they can to not pay you more than the work and the value of work that you perform. And indeed, certain lien legislations require 10% holdback in case somebody's not getting paid for a claim or other reasons uh, that's held in a trust. Uh, so lien legislation usually works in that area and that makes it very difficult for a contractor to be getting the amount of money that um, they, represents the work that they've been doing because 10% right off the bat is being held back um, for regulatory requirements. So uh, alas, as I mentioned, it's not really that it doesn't work out that way, perfect world for either party. Um, it really works out to a negotiated sense and so we that means we have to place value on the work as it's being performed we have to know what the values are as the work is being performed and we call that a schedule of values where we pull out uh, before we start the project and we evaluate certain amounts of the work that's going to be done so that when that work is then performed we know how much money from a client's perspective to release in that payment or if we know the value of this work is um, $100,000, when you perform 50% of that work, we might put a value of it at $50,000. Uh, but we have to, before work starts, have an agreement of what the values are on the breakdown of work that will be performed so that then when the progress billings are done, um, they're representative of what we agreed to before we started the work. Uh, so that means you do have to be able to break down your costs um, that way and have a good understanding of what is going on. And of course, from a contractor to a subcontractor perspective, we also, they, it's the same thing as between a general contractor and a client. It's the same thing with a subcontractor. Ideally, I would not pay that subcontractor for as long as possible. Um, you know, the same idea. I wouldn't pay them till they're finished all their work. From a subcontractor perspective, I would ideally, in perfect world, like to get all my money up front. So again, that's another negotiated aspect on the value of their work that's been performed because they're going to be billing you and you're going to be billing the client. So you want to make sure that you're not getting overbilled and the client's then refusing the work that you're saying was done. So there's a coordination process um, that that comes um, through. You know, all this stuff sounds simple enough, but the transfer of money is never simple. Um, there's always concerns and there's hiccups as too. So you need to have adequate buffers in place as a business to be able to cover those amounts and shortfalls if they should occur. And to make sure that your payments and your billings are up to date. If I don't pay my subcontractor when I'm supposed to pay them, then they're not gonna wanna work for me. Uh, or they may start charging me premiums on future projects, or they may start charging me interest rates on this particular project. So we do have to be conscious of um, that from that perspective. And um, generally, uh, we get paid in progress payments. You know, you, you buy a house, maybe new construction. Uh, you might not pay the bulk of the house till you close on the house when the property is actually turned over to you. You may have a series of payments that you make during construction, but that pales in comparison to the overall value of the property with the house on it that um, you pay near the end of the project. Uh, whereas progress payments, most projects, it's going to be really valued as the project proceeds from that perspective. And so we have to have an estimate of uh, work complete. So when we update a project, we need to have a very accurate representation of the work that's been done up to that point and then set a value on that amount. Um, so, and if there's a holdback amount, like I said earlier, usually for the retainage is usually for lien um, purposes, uh, then that needs to be held back. Um, and that's not released till final completion. And that would be, based on lean legislative requirements. So um, schedule of values and progress payments follow um, those um, requirements. 
And so we really have to list out the major construction activities and um, the areas of work that are being done and that we're monitoring and that we're dealing, detailing, and that we can have a value placed on it. And probably the easiest way for me to explain that uh, visually, I think, is just going through maybe a, um, a project example. So if I bring up um, Microsoft Project in this particular example, I think I brought this up before to show work breakdown structure, activities, and dates. And I think I may have shown you quickly the cash flow, but now that we're on this specific topic, I'll just run through it. Uh, likely in future courses, um, you will be using scheduling software to add costs onto a project. And if you've done that, then you would have a total cost allocated for your project. So in this case, um, we're just under $900,000 for this particular project. Um, so the value is set at that. And we can now... Um, look at how we've allocated the funds. So in construction, we actually have $721,000 allocated. Pre-construction would be the rest. Uh, and we have in various areas allocated certain amounts of money. And if we want to dig down, we can see in more detail where that money is allocated. So we can see which activities we intend to pay out the money and to who we intend to pay it out. So we could actually look at that from another perspective too, and we could tie that into when. Um, we could insert a column that would be um, uh, start and finish. So we could also associate that with when do we intend to pay that money out? You know, at the end of this activity, so maybe that's gonna be there. At the start of an activity, then maybe that would be there. So it depends how we intend to pay the money out because timing is important as well. So if we're going to pay the money out, we have to pay it to somebody. That somebody is a resource. And whoever that resource is, we have allocated money to them. So we would have had to predefine, well, who are the resources that we are using on this particular project? And so who are we going to be contracting the work with? And so we might have the HVAC sub, we might have the sprinkler sub, um, the network cabling sub, etc. So these are all our subcontractors uh, that we intend to have on the project. Maybe we intend to have our own forces like a project manager, a superintendent, and laborers of our own on the project. Maybe we intend to have a maximum of three laborers at some point. And we've allocated hourly rates to them. Well, we intend, how do we intend to pay that out? Well, we've got three choices. At the start, prorated, or at the end? Well, if this project is a year long, uh, if I put this at the start, that would mean I'm going to pay this project manager whatever they would make in a year on the project on the first day. Not a good idea, right? If I put it at the end, then I'm not going to pay them till the end of the project. Not a good idea. If I put it prorated, it means I'm going to pay them as the work proceeds. So that would maybe be an okay idea uh, for anybody that I'm going to pay on a regular basis. So that would be representative that way. For my subcontractors, I've got them all down as a cost, not as work. So I'm going to put amounts of money like I just showed you on those particular activities, right? So if I go back to my Gantt chart, I'm going to be putting amounts of money when I intend to pay the money out to certain subcontractors. So in that case, I might want to make a decision. Well, with a subcontractor, maybe I don't want to do it prorated. Maybe I want to put it at the end of whatever that activity is. So if the activity is 20 days, I'm not paying them at the first day. I'm going to pay them after 20 days. So maybe I'm going to want to put this at the end. So I could do that. And then what it will do is it'll calculate at the end of that activity, they would get paid. And that's helpful for me. If you know, I've got an activity that's 20 days long, I'm not paying them at the beginning of it, I'm paying them at the end of it. Because how I apply the money in the software program is going to tell me when the money is actually going to leave the company. 
when we're going to pay it out within reason. It doesn't really adjust for 30 days, but it gives you a pretty good um, long-term view of how the money is flowing out of the project. So when those costs are being incurred. I could go individually if some of these I wasn't going to do and I was going to pay it maybe at the start, like maybe concrete as soon as they deliver it, I'm going to pay it at the start. Um, pretty much concrete works that way anyways, whether I have it at the start or the end, it's kind of, um, if it was cubic meters of concrete and a concrete supplier, I'm paying it either at the beginning of that day or the end of the day, it's the same thing. Like it doesn't really matter on something like that, but a lot of things it does matter on. So how we put it, it does matter on. Um, so. I've got that placed that way and that's kind of looking, I want you to think about cash flow on a project. It's as things are happening, how is the money being spent? You may have periods of time where there's not a lot of money coming out of the project and you may have a lot of sometimes where there's a lot of money going out of the project. So the next question comes, if I've got that much money going out, how much money do I have coming in? So if I'm looking at that, that also would tell me with my schedule of values to the client, the expectations attached to the activities of work, what I'm going to be billing for at those moments in time to try to match the money that's going out with the money that's coming in. Because on the other side of things, yes, the client holds back 10%, but you also have profit embedded into your price and you have amounts for overhead embedded in your price. So. Um, there's a certain amount of flexibility that comes into that as well. So that matching of cash flow is important. But I see this and I see the cost there. I'm just curious, did I match all of my pricing for my particular subcontractor? Like I see I've got forming sub 20,000, forming sub 15,000, forming sub 8,000. So do I have to add all these amounts up? Because this is where I put in where I expect I have to pay the forming sub based on the schedule of values I've worked out with the forming sub payment schedule, right? So I've got to make sure this adds up to my contract amount with that forming sub. So I should look at my resource sheet and it doesn't tell me anything about costs here. But if I go to a different screen and I look at cost, I can see where is my um, forming sub? I can see how much money that I've allocated for my um, forming sub uh, contractor. So somewhere here, let's see, we've got, there we go, number 13. So we've got our concrete forming sub and we've got them set at $43,600. So that's how much I've assigned in the project to pay out to the forming sub. So that better match my contract. If it doesn't, I better go back in and make sure that I've applied the right amount in the right places. So that's my check that this should fit my budget amounts for these particular line items. And then when I actually run the project and I update it, I'll be able to see if there's any variances in costs uh, compared to what my plan was because I will save this, set this as my baseline and then when things change, it'll show me variances. It'll also show me how much money has been incurred in the work that they performed as it's going and how much is left to pay out as the project proceeds. So from a cash flow perspective, you really are looking at when does the work get performed, how much does it cost and when do I have to pay it out? And how does that match up against my schedule of values with the client that I've broken down to ensure that I have enough money as a company to cover this? And don't forget a construction company is not only going to look at it for one project, they got to think about it for all the, their projects because they could run into a cash crunch where there's a moment in time, they're all profitable projects, but there's so much money going out, they don't have enough to match it. So this could help them forecast in advance where they may have a liquidity shortfall. And what would you do at that point? If you see six months down the road or eight months down the road with all the projects that you have, you're going to have a liquidity shortfall. What could you do? Think about that. What could you do? Maybe pause it and think about it. Well, if it were me, I could look at my projects, I could look at 
negotiating longer payment terms, maybe with some of my suppliers, maybe going 45 or 60 days, uh, sub subcontractors, let them know in advance. That would be one choice. Another choice would be to look at the timing of the projects. Maybe I could have a later start on one of the projects. Maybe there's flexibility there. I could definitely look at putting together my business plan and ensuring that I up my lines of credits with my financial institutions. If you're doing this well in advance and you've got a business plan together and you're showing your, your projects and the profitability on your projects, banks feel confident in lending you money. On the other hand, if you're doing this at the last minute, going in there like a deer with the headlights in the headlights, um, I'm a banker. Why would I want to lend you money? I'd be asking like, how did you get yourself into this position that all of a sudden now you need this money, right? So um, you need to, it's it's really being proactive in the in the management of your business and the management of your projects. So cash flow is really important from that aspect. And that means also getting correct data from the site. And in this course, we've talked about the importance of the gathering of data. And that would include like time cards and making sure that uh, the value of the work has been expressly defined and what's been clearly done in your schedule updates so that basically you can now put that into your progress payments, which is tying to what you defined as your schedule of values for the work being performed earlier uh, before you actually started the project. So what does all this mean here? Like I've got this here and I could go back to my project, right? And I could see my um, Gantt chart uh, with my data. I could even go to a resource sheet and I could, oops, uh, in one more down, I think. So I could even go to my resource usage and I could even see who is using, who is spending what money and when the money is actually being spent. So this actually gives me um, the resources that are being used and when it's actually being used. So I can actually um, see the laborers, what activities they are attached to and how much money is going out of the project every day. I can see my electrical sub or my plumbing sub when the money is actually going out, when the timing is. I can look at it from the day and I can also look at it from the month. I can see how much money here by individuals are being spent and going out uh, of the project on a daily basis and a weekly basis and a monthly basis. So it's really kind of interesting when that data gets put into it. Now you notice here um, where I've got laborers, it's showing money like for individual activities that are attached to the laborers, like the amount of money that's going out on a monthly basis. And that's because I've got them, they work for me and I've got that basically prorated. On the other hand, because I made the electrical sub, uh, I made the electrical sub at the end of their activities, it's spotty. It's coming out when they are billing me for the work they performed, which is fine. That's the way it should be because I, I only want to look at what, I don't want to necessarily look at them prorated. I want to look at them from when my billings for the work is going to be tied to it. So that's fine, but I could monitor this in a very close um, granular uh, way here. Um, very, very detailed if I wanted to, right? Uh, or I could also print off reports or just look at reports. So I could go to the report tab where it says costs and there's cash flow. So I could look at cash flow and then I can see how much money is going out of the project by the quarter. That's not going to help me every three months too much. So if I click here, um, actually if I click here, it should bring up this field list over here. I can edit the time and I can say, don't show me by the quarter. That's not really helping me. Show me by the month. I want to see how much money is going out by the month. And so these blue bars represent how much money is going out every month. So you can see it pretty much peaks in September that I've got $170,000 going out. I better make sure that I've got around 170,000 coming in or that I have enough liquidity, cash in the bank, or that I have enough line of credit to cover that amount. So that's giving me that heads up that I could see if I've got a shortfall. Like if I've got a large amount of cash, I could, uh, in the bank, I could look at, well, how much will I forecast to have at that point? Do I need to have extra amounts on my line of credit? 
I could also be concerned about something. So I might look at, well, how can I ensure that I have enough in my progress billings that's going to cover that? But this gives me a good indicator of the amount of money that's going to flow out approximately when, right? There's always delays in payments and 30-day offsets, but it gives me a pretty good idea and sense where the cash flow is moving on this particular project. And this line over here is actually the cumulative. So if you remember, what were we at? We were at $897,000. So this is how much overall on the project that is being paid out, right? So um, what has been aligned for the overall budget for this project. So I better make sure if that's the money that's going out, um, that uh, the money coming in is more than that overall because I have overhead and I have profit that I have to cover. So I've got to look at what's my budget, what's my overhead for the project, and what's my profit for the project. You know, if, my, if I have 897000 going out, and I have 897,000 coming in, then that means I haven't covered my overhead and I haven't covered my profit. Uh, so my profit target. So in a previous lecture, we talked about that and basically how that lines up on each other. Uh, so we have to consider that with um, our cash flow and ensuring that we have adequate cash flow to be successful. So this is just using a software tool, Microsoft Project um, as the tool. Um, those of you in the construction um, technology uh, course in your next semester, you will get a course on project management, planning and scheduling, where you'll learn how to apply uh, costs and to detail out a schedule and how all of that um, works uh, from that perspective. For me, it's just a software tool. Any software that does it, manages it, it's really sort of conceptualizing in your mind exactly how it's done. For those of you that are a little bit more ambitious, if you click subscribe on my YouTube page and you go to the playlist MS Project, you'll see that there's a series of videos that shows you how to use MS Project to um, be able to define a schedule, add resources, and add costs to it. So that can be helpful for you uh, in the future. You don't have to do that for this particular course, but in this course, I want you to understand how cash flow is applied at times or ca cash amounts that they're paid out at certain amounts of time. And then what we need to do is match those and make sure that we have enough liquidity because it sink it's, can sink the biggest and best companies um, in the world on this. And if for those of you that go further in your studies, like the third year construction technology, um, then you'll find that we do that in cost control as well. And we really sort of dive into this even more deeply than you will um, next semester on this. Um, so it's really important because that's that's why your boss is going to be really concerned about billings and the amount of money that's being spent because this is one of the drivers that determines your profitability as well. Um, and if you're having to take out bank loans and finance the project unnecessarily, that's got a cost implication too because you have to pay a fairly high interest rates on the, those amounts. Even though interest rates are low right now, that's still an amount that's coming off your profit. Maybe it didn't need to if you better manage your cash flow. So key, I just wanted to show you in that um, video for that uh, purpose so that you could see it. So the schedule of values uh, really, um, just make sure yeah, I'm in the right spot. So project cash flow, really that's what it's all about um, for progress payments. Uh, so that we can make sure that when we make those that we can also justify the work that's complete and the costs associated with that. Sometimes uh, it takes a little bit of explaining and clarification. So that's why you want to make sure that of that. These are estimates only. So, you know, there can be other factors. You could be delayed in the project. Uh, the owner could delay paying you for what, a variety of reasons. So you have to have some buffers built in to make sure, you know, you're not operating right to the line on that because things don't always work out as planned. And that's why you're being proactive uh, about that. And um, depending on contract requirements too, you have to always look to the contract. What is it um, requiring? Um, so uh, AIA and the, in the US and sometimes here too in Canada and CCDC, Canadian Construction Document Committee's documents on, uh, depending on the contract type, whether it's a design bid build, a construction management contract, whatever it may be. 
So payment processing, uh, contractor completes the payment application. So usually the consultant uh, working in the owner's interest will then certify. They'll want to see the, the site. In some more complex projects, they'll have actually a quantity surveyor that they will have hired to come and make sure and certify that the work you're saying is done is actually done and that the values represent um, the amounts that you're saying. Um, that's one way that they protect their interest. And if the if the client is borrowing money from a bank or a financial institution, before the financial institution will release the money uh, that the owner or client is borrowing, they will want to certify that work has been performed. They don't want to give that money to the client and find out it wasn't done and then the client goes bankrupt and they're taking over the project. They want to make sure that this represents the value they expect. So it gets complex in that area. And there's uh, companies that specialize in, um, well, one of their services is specializing in the certification of uh, the work that's been uh, performed from uh, that perspective on the project. Usually payment is around 30 days. Uh, Ontario has recently changed. They have what they call the Construction Act and that's to try to impose and ensure that payments are made within 30 days. It's fairly new and how well it's working, I'm not exactly sure yet. I think nobody is, uh, but uh, that has come about because it's kind of, stre it was stretching out. Like it was like getting, it used to be like, when I was running business, uh, construction business, it was around 30 days and then it was getting to be 45 days and then it was getting to be 60 days and some European contractors coming in we're trying to get even longer payment time periods. So the government kind of, because that, that puts a real clamp on some construction companies and it can make them go bankrupt, as I was mentioning. So the government's tried to put a clamp on how long and to try to make it more regimented that way and that some people aren't taking advantage of other people. Does it still happen? I'm quite sure it does, but um, that's kind of the goal in the industry. So it's kind of this, you know, uh, process flowchart, if you will, assemble data for payment request. Um, con is the contractor's activity complete? Um, prepare application for a progress payment. Submit the application to the con architect. I'll say consultant. Depends, you know, who's representing the client's interest. It may not be an architect. It's kind of a little old school thinking. I'd say consultant. Um, very often it is the architectural firm, but. Is the application correct, right? And if it's not, meaning there's problems, it's not clear, it doesn't describe the work that's been done or the breakdown doesn't match to the schedule of values that was decided earlier before you started the work, um, then they will send it back, right? Um, if it is okay, uh, from the architect's perspective, they'll submit it to the owner and they'll say they reviewed it and this does uh, represent the work that was done. The owner will review it, make sure it makes sense to them, and then they'll pro uh, process the payment. And the owner always pays the contractor directly because the contract is between the owner and the contractor. The consultant is just certifying that that work was done and it was done to the quality expectation uh, that was described in the contract and the schedule of values. So that's pretty much what I wanted to um, go over today. So I think you can see that uh, the progress payments and the flow, well, flow of money, it's always important, right? You don't get paid, it's a big problem, uh, is uh, really important from that uh, perspective. And um, uh, making sure that uh, you meet the contract requirements and that you negotiate good terms in your procurement processes with the various suppliers and subcontractors is vitally important as well. And really in construction that you uh, build a good brand reputation with your with your um, subcontractors and suppliers. If you kind of have a reputation of not paying or causing problems, the best tend to not want to work with you. Or if they do, they put a price premium on it for the hassle they're going to go through. So there's a lot of contractors that pride themselves on paying when the work is being performed in a reasonably um, quick manner. All right, so that's what I, as I said, I wanted to cover. So this is Tom Stevenson wishing you a wonderful day and we'll see you next time. Bye for now.